My name is Sally Miller, and I'm a professor of plant pathology at The Ohio State University and currently director of the APS Office of International Programs Board. I'm also an extension plant pathologist, serving as state specialist for vegetable disease management in Ohio for more than 20 years. Like many of my extension colleagues, I also do research and teach. The APS Graduate Student Committee asked me to talk about the future of extension plant pathology. This is not an easy task as extension is in a period of rapid change and the crystal ball is a little murky at the moment. However, I'll do my best to present a plausible picture of where extension plant pathology is going in the context of not only our historical mission, but also of the phenomenal changes in knowledge dissemination that marked the last 20 years. The history of plant pathology in the Western world as a distinct discipline reaches back to the mid-19th century and the late flight epidemic, about 70 years before President Woodrow Wilson signed the Smith-Lever Act in 1914 that established the system of cooperative extension in the United States. Its purpose was to diffuse knowledge on agriculture, home economics, and other subjects to the farming communities of the United States. The act linked extension to the land-grant universities, a critically important connection between the generation of knowledge and its dissemination. In my view, this very close linkage between research and extension has been a major factor in innovation and forward progress in agriculture over the past century. My work as a plant pathologist has taken me all over the world, and I've observed that where research institutes and extension services are separated, neither have the impact that they could and should have. So as we approach the 100th anniversary of formal cooperative extension in the United States and more than 100 years of extension plant pathology, it is particularly appropriate that we take a look at our history, where we are now, and where we may go in the future. While today's farming systems scarcely resemble those of 1914, the purpose of extension is the same, to translate knowledge to action for the good of the public. This cartoon is a simplified representation of the delivery of knowledge from source to recipient. As you can see, the flow of information is not unidirectional. In the most successful outreach systems, feedback loops between all the players are actively encouraged. In an ideal scenario, innovations from basic research are applied in the field, which is a general term for real life situations, and the results of those studies are made available to end users either directly from applied researchers or indirectly through others, such as extension educators. End users provide feedback on research innovations based on their own knowledge and observations. Stakeholders such as farmers are also likely to be the first to notice the presence of invasive species, the failure of a fungicide or resistant variety, an upsurge in endemic pathogens, or the effects of climate change on their crops. As an applied researcher, most of my better ideas are the result of direct and indirect interactions with farmers and other first-line stakeholders who have related their problems, ideas, observations, and concerns. I'm a University of Wisconsin alumnus and have never forgotten Professor J.C. Walker's famous quote, always remember to keep one foot in the furrow. Just as agriculture and information technology have changed, so has extension and it must continue to change at an even faster pace than in the past. So what will extension, and specifically extension plant pathology, look like? Well, not like this. The photo on the left shows a group of extension workers from the 1920s, and on the right is a scene from a 1960s sitcom called Green Acres, in which county agent Hank Kimball on the right is dispensing advice to the novice farmer on the left. Funding for extension at the local level has been declining for decades, and the last economic downturn resulted in significant reduction in staffing at some county offices, closure at others, and regionalization of services in many states. County extension educators are changing their approach to extension delivery to adjust for these changes and the pressures of competing sources of information. Secondly, it's apparent that with some exceptions, women and minorities were pretty much absent from production agriculture extension during the times pictured here. Even in the late 1970s and early 1980s when I was a graduate student, women were not encouraged to take faculty positions that incur included an extension appointment since many thought that farmers did not like women in extension. 
This collage of OSU's extension plant pathology team is fairly representative of extension plant pathology in the United States. We are more diverse than ever before, and this diversity brings richness to our engagement with a broad array of stakeholders. While we have a way to go in minority representation, we are rapidly increasing the number of women participating in extension plant pathology. Currently, representation of women in extension plant pathology at 32% is slightly higher than that of APS at 30%. 54% of APS student members are women. I believe that it's fair to predict that in the future, extension plant pathology will look more and more like American society, certainly in gender and we hope in minority representation. In the face of continuing reductions in funding for extension, one has to ask if there will be jobs for extension plant pathologists in the future. Yes, there will be jobs, but it's difficult to predict how many given that the United States is just emerging from the Great Recession and the political landscapes at the federal and state levels can be fractious and unpredictable. The number of extension plant pathology appointments in land-grant universities rose almost continuously between 1953 and 2007. But extension plant pathology was not spared the negative effects of the recent severe economic downturn. APS member survey data indicate a precipitous drop in the percentage of extension pathologists from about 30% in 2007 to about 20% in 2009. This trend is supported by a study by Everts et al. in 2012, which showed an overall loss of 10% of extension plant pathology positions from seven major U.S. universities between 2007 and 2011. The larger drop in FTEs than in the number of people indicates that there are more split appointments with extension reductions balanced by increases from other funding lines. This appears to be a continuation of a trend towards more split appointments that began in the 1960s. Between 1982 and 2007, there was a 24.2% increase in split appointments that included an extension. While split appointments may have increased by necessity due to funding cuts at the university level, I believe they are very good for plant pathology extension. And the percentage of extension plant pathologists with split appointments is likely to increase in the future. Extension is all about teaching, so it's natural that extension plant pathologists also bring their expertise on diagnostics, disease management, and specialized subjects to the university classroom. Split appointments with a research component are very effective in bringing scientific innovation to stakeholders. Extension plant pathologists conduct applied research that has a direct near-term impact on agriculture. Direct connections with growers not only fosters communications about problems in the field, but also opportunities for research on new products and technology, both on station and on cooperating farms. Trust is built upon relationships that develop between researchers and growers and enhance the adoption of new practices and products. Applied researchers also have access to plant pathologists conducting basic research that growers don't have and can serve as a conduit between the two. Having the applied researcher and the extension professional rolled up in the same person adds efficiencies and builds trust between the academic community and the farming community. We live in an era of increasing demands for accountability, which often translate into demonstrations of the impact of our work in the real world. The last Farm Bill required that competitive funding programs include integrative projects that include both research and outreach and demonstrate clearly the involvement of stakeholders from the beginning through the end. When programs include extension as an integral part of the project and not merely a poorly funded add-on, the relationships between research, extension, and the farming community are clearly strengthened, as is the impact of the research. It does not appear that requirements for innovation and integration will go away in the foreseeable future, so demand for applied researchers and extension specialists should increase to meet these requirements and promote initiatives with measurable and positive impacts in agriculture. Extension is, is at a crossroads in information delivery. Times have changed and extension plant pathology is changing with it. The richness of face-to-face -face information delivery so treasured in previous years has evolved from one-on-one -on -one to one for many. So how can extension plant pathology adjust to the new norms, reaching more of our clientele while maintaining their trust in the quality of the information we provide? 
we must adopt approaches that take into account what information they need and how they want to receive it. This involves asking, listening to the answers, and avoiding the temptation to tell them what we think they need to know. We are in a state of information overload, and there is a vast and confusing array of websites, social media, tweets, blogs, videos, apps, wikis, ebooks, and other things out there. The challenge is to be heard above the noise. Farmers are adopting technology at a rapid pace. In this survey of about 40 Ohio tomato farmers I conducted in 2012, all of them used a cell phone, and half used a smartphone. Almost 72% of our Ohio tomato farmers used the internet every day for farm business, and 90% used it at least several times a week. And this was despite the fact that 40% were over the age of 50. Every growing season, I received numerous photos of symptomatic vegetables that growers have snapped on a smartphone and emailed or texted to me with a request for diagnosis and what to do. Many farmers are using iPads and other tablets as well as smartphones to increase efficiency. This provides an unprecedented opportunity for extension plant pathologists to provide easily accessible interactive content through online fact sheets, newsletters, videos, apps, and ebooks. Twitter can be used to provide updates on disease outbreaks, invasive species, and other time sensitive issues. Distance education technology like Polycom and Skype allows us to have face-to-face -face richness with clientele in far-flung locations. Webinars can be presented as full-blown classroom-style lectures or as brief attention-getting videos. We are also beginning to see interesting applications of crowdsourcing in which answers or solutions are obtained by bringing the question or problem to an online community. This can be small and selective, comprised of people with similar interests helping each other through a closed listserv. Much larger cohorts can be reached by free open forums like Plant Village, which uses community voting to rank both answers and answerers, ideally bringing the best information to the forefront ahead of the noise. Future extension plant pathologists will need to utilize technology that their clientele are also willing to use. We will still have significant stakeholder groups who for various reasons resist or are unable to adopt this type of technology, and exceptions must be made to reach them by more traditional means. Extension has fully embraced the Internet. eExtension has been developed as the flagship national program for Internet-based delivery of outreach material. It is a collaborative workspace organized into communities of practice. The community of practice workspaces offer extension practitioners opportunities for information dissemination in the form of fact sheets, webinars, videos, blogs, and more. The public can ask questions online that are answered by extension experts. When a user enters eExtension, he or she sees the web page of the local university extension program providing ownership to these programs in every state. University outreach programs still maintain their own internet-based information delivery systems, and in some ways eExtension is competing with these. There are many websites with excellent information on plant disease diagnostics and management that are accessible to farmers and other clientele with the interest to find them. One of the challenges of extension is to make sure that accurate and helpful content manage to get on page one of every Google search. In 2005, APS charged a team led by Dr. Joyce Loper and Dr. Ann Vidver to come up with a vision of plant pathology in the 21st century. Their vision of outreach included all the issues I've talked about here and some I've neglected, like international development and cooperation, something very close to my heart. Suffice it to say that many plant pathologists have happily shared their expertise throughout the world to protect crops and promote food safety and security, a clean environment, and economic development. I'd like to close by pointing out another of the team's visions that is especially appropriate for extension plant pathology. We suffer a bit by being considered rather esoteric by the general public. Just try to explain phytopathology to some of your friends from high school. We need to use more of our outreach expertise to help the general public understand the importance of our work. The future will not only be about doing good, but proving to the public at large that the good that we do also benefits them. This is the public value movement. 
The vast majority of Americans are several generations removed from farming and may not even know any par farmers personally. They are not likely to care, for example, that early warning systems to detect invasive pathogens developed and promoted by plant pathologists save farmers millions of dollars in crop losses. This is a private or personal good because it benefits a small number of individuals. The public is more impressed that fresh vegetables are plentiful and cheap and that their water is clean. That is a public good. We have to continue to serve our immediate clientele while at the same time promoting the message that what is good for farmers is good for the country and the world. I thank the Graduate Student Committee for inviting me to contribute to this webcast series and encourage all of you to keep up the good work.